Thanks again, Janet. I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to attempt to do something um, death-defying here in the 20 minutes that I've been asked to read for something highly unusual in a poetry reading. I'm going to try, given that it is the summer solstice, I'm going to try to not mention death once in any of my poems. <laughs> and I'm going to try and honor the weather that we have. Luckily, I have a poem called Midsummer. How prescient of me. <laughs> um, uh, the, the book that Janet mentioned, uh, this one X, that is my sixth collection, um, although it, it was completely written in Manchester and, uh, and mostly centres around where I live in Charlton and specifically my garden, um, which is only a little silly little garden, but anyway, um, it stands in for, for much, which is how people use gardens, I think, traditionally in poetry anyway. So this one is set in that house a perfectly ordinary house and set in the garden, in the perfectly ordinary garden of the perfectly ordinary house and it's called Midsummer. And it is a little bit about not only the time of year and the sensation of this time of year but also the experience, I suppose, of bringing a life that was formed in another culture, in another place, to bear on this place. Midsummer. All to play for. Yesterday the rain kept hinting it had something else to say. Today is a garden with clothes on the line, that smell of childhood and the kind of endings that folded themselves into tidy squares within arm's reach of the sea. Today is tilted skylights and doors held open with bricks. Today is next door breaking eggs on the edge of a glass bowl. Today is a phrase learned of by heart, by asters and peonies also by fuchsia and mallow, and everything between. Tonight I will sleep on a sheet that had joy of a bare-faced sun above the cherry tree, and tonight there will be 200 moons stowed between panes of double glazing in both my dovetailed dreams of being home. In the window of the drawing room, there is a rush of white as you pass, in which the figure of your husband is, for a moment, framed. He is watching you. His father will come, of course, and although you had not planned it, his beard will offset your lay stress, and always it will seem that you were friends. All morning you had prepared the house, and now you have stepped out to make sure that everything is in its proper place. The railings whitened, fresh gravel on the avenue, the glass house crystal when you stand in the courtyard, expecting the carriage to arrive at any moment. You are pleased with the day. All month it has been warm. They say it will be one of the hottest summers the world has ever known. Today, your son is one year old. Later, you will try to recall how he felt in your arms, the weight of him, the way he turned to you from sleep, the exact moment when you knew he would cry and the photograph be lost. But it is not lost. You stand a well-appointed group with an air of being pleasantly surprised. You will come to love this photograph and will remember how, when he had finished, you invited the photographer inside and how, in celebration of the day, you drank a toast to him and summertime. Okay, when I was a child, and that, that uh, poem just there was written about with a photograph taken from my father's first birthday in 1911. And when I was a child, all our holidays were spent going with him over to the west of Ireland to a little fishing village called Spiddle in County Galway, um, which is right on the edge. And um, Spiddle is a town well, it's a village that doesn't have a whole lot going on in it except its fishing industry. And to service this, it has a very large pier, which was built as a form of famine relief. One of those, it's not at all like um, an English Brighton pier or anything like that. It's a fishing pier made out of uh, stone. And it's three, uh, three tiers high. It's probably, it wouldn't be as high as the stained glass windows, but it wouldn't be too much shorter. And uh, one of the things that kids do when they visit is they climb up to the first level, 
and they climb up to the second level, they climb up to the third level, and then they throw themselves off down into the water, and then they swim around, and they come up again, and they do it all over again. And I watched them, and I thought, I'd love to do it. And then I thought, I'm never gonna do it. <laughs> I'm too old and too scared, and I don't like heights, so I thought I will write a poem about doing it, and it'll be the closest that I might get. It opens with a little quote from one of Auden's sonnets from China, his 17th sonnet, which says, which has the line in it, speak to our muscles of a need for joy. Pier. Left at the lodge and park, snout to America, stripped to togs a shouldered towel, flip-flop over the tarmac past the gangplank rooted barge, two upended rowboats and trawlers biding time. Nod to a fisherman propped on a bollard, exchange the weather, climb the final steps up to the ridge, and then let fly, push wide, tuck up your knees so the blue nets hold you wide open, that extra beat. Gulp, cloud, fling a jet trail round your neck like a feather boa, toss every bone and sinew to the plunge, enter the tide as if it were nothing, really, nothing to do with you. Kick back, release your ankles from its coiled ropes, slit water, drag it open, catch your breath, haul yourself up into August, do it over, raucously, head first, this time, shout. Those that survive tend to be in Irish speaking areas, which is why I've given it an Irish language title. On Chokthi, Thistledown, Fuchsia, Flagstone Floor. This noun house has the wherewithal to sit out centuries, squat between bogwater darkness and rooms turned inside out to summer. Straw colored months of childhood answering each other like opposite windows in thick set walls that sunlight will cajole. Tea roses bluster the half door. Rain from eaves footfalls the gravel. A robin, cocksure of himself, frittered away all morning in the shrub. If I knew how to fix in even one language the noise of his wings in flight, I wouldn't need another word. So far, no death. <laughs> Although the robin's probably croaked by now. <laughs> Um, okay, so from a half door then to the front door, and a poem about time passing in a happy way. The front door. The sky inside my head grows out of a single cell of blue. One minute I'm snicking geraniums, and before you know it, there's larks and curlews and a jet trail with no beginning to it, unzipping my last thought. One minute, I'm pinning my to-do list like a discouraged orchid to the day. The next, here in the kitchen, the night's two plums are bedding down in their black lacquer bowl. Between, the day rises to a skim of meaning, the bright blue door opening into what I think I know. Everything else is an eye of daylight through which is streaming time and again, what all happens next. Okay, I wanted to read a poem for you which is based on a painting by the French painter um, André Durand, who has an extraordinary capacity, I think, to paint the sensation of heat. So when you look at one of his paintings, set a lot of them in the, in the south of France, you, you feel dusty or looking at it, you feel hot, your skin feels as though it is experiencing the sensation of heat. And you can't help but add narratives onto the experience. Um, even though he generally paints no people into his paintings, you can't help but imagine them there. A little bit like Geoffrey did in his poem, you take something that is unpeopled and you people it because you can. Um, La Route, André Durand, 1932. Three bars of shadow on a, on a yellow road, a sky of Chinese blue. Though there is only the road and its sidelong songs to mark time with you, 
walk on. Trees talking, shadow talk, will make no mention of you. With your ash plant and knapsack, you have no notion of rain or thunder with no rain in it, scarcely worth sheltering from. Even if the village had roofs and doors to the houses, music to its two streets. If you are sorry, as I was, that you didn't bring bread with you and something to wash it down and maybe a fig for afterwards, don't give it another thought. This is one of many villages that turns its open palms up to the sun. Next along the yellow road, another town will occur to you, this time approached by a bridge. You will hear cow bells and church bells and a donkey whinging at them. You will smell loaves rising and you will quicken your step until your footprints in the dust fall upon footprints in the dust to lead you to a stranger's door. No one will be surprised to see you, for your own two children will be waiting there with a welcome for you like a jar of wild flowers and no harm done. Okay, I'm going to just um, read three more poems, two from a sequence that's in X about this garden, this metaphoric and also quite real garden. Um, and it's a sequence of 13 poems, but um, some of them are a little darker than others, so clearly I'm going to avoid these. But I am going to, to read one which centers on something that I may have imagined in the way that memory does. Um, I do know for certain that, that my parents, who are now dead, shared the same birthday, which was June the 10th, different years, but the same day. And I know it was always a kind of like a, um, a shared, um, intimate thing between them. Um, and I think I do remember the subject of this poem happening when I was a child. The Garden in Sentiment. Because she picked for him one bud of Albertine rose, laced it through his work suit lapel and straight pinned the stem behind. Because he watched her do it, kissed her forehead, then kissed her hand. And because I watched them from the first of summer, one June, lives ago, I keep no Albertine in my garden. I have no need of it. And I'm going to finish with a couple of poems that I wrote for my children. Um, one for my son, who has uh, just turned 19, came home after his exams and said, I'm going to Paris, which was quite a new thing for him to say. Um, and I suppose the thing is, when I was writing these two poems, was that I had a sense of them developing a life of their own, lives of their own, their own independence, their own way of making decisions, their own way of cutting loose. Um, and this one, yeah, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. The Six Gardens of Metaphor for Tommy. One is a wood of a single tree, a branch with metal leaves attached by way of a copper beech. One is a river, a length of brown ribbon tied to a needle of pure gold. One is an ocean, sea heath and sea holly, with an undertow of moss. One is a mountain, a stretch of centuries within a pebble's reach. One is mist in a hollow, an acer over gravel, raked to a new day. One is the future, readied for you, behind this bamboo screen. And I'm going to finish then with one I wrote for my daughter when she was round about 16 and uh, yeah, just beginning to, to push into a life of her own, um, as 16 year olds tend to do. Going out for Eve. My daughter, heading out on the town in her glad rags, laughs a laugh like a floribunda rose pinned in her hair. She has so much beauty in her, more than this summer evening in all its frippery, more even 
than the sound of her heels, the length of the road, her phone voice dipping into company, the pooled high talk of her and her friends slipping through the city's open door. Do me a favor, daughter, sometime in time, wear for me a sweetheart neckline, slingback sandals, my good ring, and howsoever many of your necklaces and bracelets. Walk your walk through 10,000 doorways, so the music of you is one and the same as the music of starlings and new moons and traffic lights and weirs, only in a new arrangement, arranged by and for you. Thank you very much.